man lovers. Whispers in the Sea is an actual play series drawing elements from stories of fantasy horror, political drama, and swashbuckling action and adventure pirate stories. As such, a list of content warnings will always be made available in the description. For our first lesson, it seems only fit for us to discuss the core of pirate philosophy in the most reasonably stretched definition of the word. You see, pirates are not unified in thought or action, acting primarily in self-interest. Even the participation in working aboard the ships they sail tends to be a means to an end, to pillage, to steal, to kill with not only impunity, but to be hailed for the act. The numbers are what they believe give them strength, keeps them safe. In this way, they have bodies to hide behind and pockets to steal from, and a ship to keep them moving from place to place, far away from the law and order of civilization. But make no mistake, there is no loyalty there. No true loyalty, or even a sense of brotherhood. We see it in the way they abandon their countries and their families, and once firmly within the righteous grip of the law, they'll even abandon their fellow crewmates. As of this morning, 64% of Union Navy enlistment are conscripted pirates. Pirates who, when faced with the consequences of their barbaric actions, chose to instead enlist within the very military they claim pirates to despise. Are quick to turn coat, especially once things get truly dangerous. They're cowards, really. Afraid to commit to anywhere or anyone, yet they claim to be honorable. Why is that? Because they have a code of ethics, the code of black arms. Written during the age of monsters, after the seas receded and the lands were once again returned to the fair people of Caledora, the code of black arms are a set of laws, so to speak. More guidelines, really, used to justify the actions of a pirate when they find it most convenient. A self-made scapegoat to absolve them of their sins. It is said that eight great lords of the sea came together to put an end to the conflict between their fleets, each of them giving a singular code to the list, giving each equal power to forge their legacies. It was written in secret so as to keep the identities of the writers a secret, in this way securing that all laws were followed equally between their fleets without bias for who wrote it. Now if you flip to page 12 in your textbooks, you will find a list of these codes and please go there so you can follow along. Rule one, pirates shall not idly bear witness to the sinking of a fellow pirate by a mutual enemy. Rule two, pirates shall honor the right of finders keepers. Rule three, pirates must be true to their word, an oath once given, never broken. Rule four, Pirates shall honor the right of parley and must do so upon neutral ground. Rule five, pirates shall not kill a person who has surrendered to them. And if a ship has no room or want of captives, then they are to be marooned at the earliest convenience. Rule six, pirates have a right to an equal share of all treasure found by their ship and crew. Rule seven, pirates must respect Our Lady the Sea, for there is no force greater, and anyone guilty of blasphemy against Our Lady shall see their sins tripled and returned unto them. Rule eight, pirates shall not kill a member of their own crew, and when disputes are had, they must be settled with fisticuffs and moderated by the ship's first mate, if available, or another neutral party. Rule nine, pirates must stand together against our mutual enemies. And if any law given were to contradict this law or the first, then it is to be cast away. Those are the laws. Eight lords, nine laws. The first of many contradictions. In this, we find the roots of a consistent theme within pirates and their culture, a lack of continuity. There is purposefully little precision in the supposed foundations of their morality. What constitutes a mutual enemy? Surely different individuals and crews will have various arrays of enemies. They believe in the law of finders keepers, yet they are expected to share their plunder with those who did not find it. And then the last law completely uproots the shallowly laid foundation of a moral code. If any law contradicts the act of standing together against their mutual enemies, then it should be ignored in its entirety. What is the purpose of a code of ethics that invalidates itself? One can only surmise that this is because the code is not written to be used in its entirety. Instead, opting for a design that is meant to be used piecemeal, picking and choosing which laws to listen to, when and under what circumstances 
circumstance, enforcing the rules whenever they deem appropriate and ignoring them once it's inconvenient or no longer useful for their narrative. At the end of the day, pirates don't even respect their so-called code they claim to uphold. As soon as it's finished its use, the code of black arms is as disposable to them as their own families. And if this is the case, and they are all out for themselves with no moral anchor to keep them steady, then the question must be asked. How can anyone trust a pirate? Ahoy there, mateys, and welcome to another episode of Tales Yet Told, an actual play podcast dedicated to telling weird and fun stories full of imagination, thoughtful characterization, and inclusivity. I am your humble game master, Kendrick Smith, or Kendo if you prefer. I use they, he pronouns, and with me today are the loveliest crew that any pirate could ask for, Gus. Kendo, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw in the little, um, uh, what is it, uh, the sailor's hornpipe at the beginning of this. It's just going to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm gonna please. Do that. Anyway, hi. I mean, sorry. Ahoy, uh, scurvy bilge rats. I'm Gus. I use he, him pronouns. Today I will be playing Felix Cormier, who uh, is going to be using he, they pronouns and is a little, just a little creep. Just a little creep is what he is. Ha, ah, this ship is filled with little creeps. Speaking of which, the next <laughs> little creep, Hilda. Excuse me? I'm sorry, I, t I needed a segue, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I got that one? You're my favorite little creep, if that makes you feel better. I'm, I'm the little creep, I'm Hilda, I'm still here. I use she, her pronouns, but I'll be playing Avery Morgan, who uses he, him pronouns and is not a little creep, but is a little bit antisocial, perhaps. Of course, we have many antisocial little not creeps here <laughs> on this ship. Speaking of which, the next one is Marcy. <laughs> I be Marceline. I use she, her pronouns. And I will be playing Bryn Thero, who uses she, her pronouns. Not a little creep, not antisocial, but maybe a little ephemeral? Arr, yes, this ship do be a little ephemeral, doesn't it? Speaking of which, <laughs> one of those ephemeral traits is our newest cast member, Ellis. Hmm. <laughs> Ellis gets ephemeral and I get little creep. Hey, look, okay. I'm fine with a complaint. What Gus okay. said. Also, well, it's Ellis's turn. I'm already causing division in the group. The term <laughs> ephemeral does not bode well for someone just starting the podcast, by the way. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, that's So true. I'm Ellis Morgan. I use they, them pronouns. I'm going to be playing Thorin uh, and Eldorus. Thorin uses he, him pronouns. Eldorus is a raven, and she uses she, her pronouns. 
And with our crew together, I guess it's time for me to drop this voice and tell you that we are playing Rapscallion Ashcan Edition by Whistler. It's the pirate game. Hello. We've said it. I've said it so many times at this point, but you should know that this is our, our pirate arc because that means, uh, and if you know that already, that means you follow us on social media at Tales Get Told on Twitter and Instagram, or you listen to the Session Zero that came out two weeks ago. And if you haven't, well... Maybe you should go listen to it just because it's good. We're kind of funny and you are going to learn so much context about who these characters are and what they do. Because will we be going over that right this second? No, we will not. That's time. Also, uh, follow the social media. There's some good stuff on there. Yeah, you should follow us on social media at Twitter and Instagram at Tales Yet Told. I'll say it again. Yeah, if you follow on Twitter, there's special character background information, character art spotify soundtrack for each character so you would do well to to hook on that you should also join the discord where you could talk to us and be our friends that's right Ooh, oh my gosh be our friends please <laughs> please be my friend We're so lonely please yeah. Be, yeah be friends with hilda <laughs> oh no <laughs> you know no one else is no one hey. else will be they all hate me please be my friend <laughs> yeah that's a lie we all love hilda here uh, you can find the link to our Discord on our Twitter page if you go to the link in our Twitter page. That'd be great. As we ring in this new season, you also should ring the notification bell on our Twitter at <laughs> oh <my laughs> twitter.com slash tales yet told. I'm really excited for this season. Uh, I'm really excited for this game. I'm really excited for this crew and all the stories that we are about to tell. Let's just very briefly go over everybody's playbooks that they're using. Uh, what your stats are and what ranks you have with the people around you. Let's start off in reverse order. Thorin, would you like to tell us your playbook and uh, who you have rank with? All right. We've got the playbook the Mantelo. My skills are blood plus one, uh, vinegar minus one, polish plus one, and spitfire zero. I believe I've got one rank with Bryn, one rank with Avery, and one rank with the ship. Awesome. I'm playing Bryn Thoreau, and I'll be playing the Navigator. I have a minus one in blood, a one in vinegar, a minus one in polish, a two in spitfire, and I have two rank with our ship, and one with Felix. Amazing. Lord Avery Morrigan? Of course. I will be playing the Chronicler. I'm playing Avery Morrigan, as stated, uh, with he, him pronouns. I have a minus two to blood, a plus one to vinegar, a plus one to polish, and a plus one to spitfire. I also have rank with Bryn and with Thorin, and I assume also with Eldorus, but that is lumped <laughs> into the one with Thorin. Eldorus is a bird, so... Mm -hmm. Eldorus is a bird, but she has personhood. For sure. She has thoughts and opinions on things. Exactly. She so, does. So I, I, I definitely am trying to ingratiate myself to the bird as well. That is a good, wise thing to do. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, cool. And Gus. Yeah, my character. Also, first of all, is Avery a lord? No, he's a sir. He's a, he's a noble. Okay. Sir would be knight. So actually, it might be young Lord Avery Morrigan. Mm, probably. Felix is uh, using the playbook The Mountebank. His stats are blood, zero. <laughs> He's got no blood. Uh, <laughs> vinegar, <laughs> also zero. Polish, minus one. And Spitfire, plus two. Oh, and he has rank with Bryn and with, um, with, uh, with someone else. With... Uh, with Who's who's this someone else? Well, just uh, just an ancient uh, ancient smoke spirit. Um, you know, as you do, ancient smoke spirits just hanging around. Sometimes you meet a ancient smoke spirit, and you know, you just you just shoot the shit, and you know, it's uh, find out you have a lot in common, and uh, <laughs> and you know, things just kind of go from there. I'm making this even weirder than it actually is, <laughs> so I'm going to shut up now. Our camera fades in on a ship carving its way through the sea. In the distance, in front of it, 
is an island, or a set of islands. And built along this set of islands, with shallow canals separating them, and finely crafted stone bridges connecting them all, Puerto Eliminado is a bustling trade port, primarily supporting trade routes from the empire, Ziegenland and Buchnan, the fort-turned-merchant inn, now named Paraiso Encontrado, stands stalwart beyond the sea gates before you. Tall buildings with white stucco walls, horseshoe-arched windows, and red clay roofs cast long shadows in clear waters of the canal. Anchored ships bob calmly in their designated spots as the tides fluctuate with the passing ships, either bringing in fresh cargo and goods to be sold, or taking whatever it is they picked up here and transporting it to its next destination. The streets are abuzz with activity, sailors loading and unloading ships, children running along the docks, identifying each and every flag flown, and blue coats on every corner, with eyes like hawks and a deep, insatiable hunger for violence. As the camera follows our ship, the Bois Perdue, as it passes the sea gate into the entrance canal leading into the large building known as Paraiso Encontrado, the camera zooms in and it catches one of our faithful crew. Thorin, what are you doing on the ship as you all are approaching your destination? As we're approaching our destination, Thorin goes to talk to Bryn about our estimated arrival time so that Thorn can then relay to the crew are the sails ready to be put up what needs to be done to get port side that kind of thing uh oh i should also say Thorn, what do you look like Thorn is a 48 year old on the smaller side in height 5'3 but very stockily built man he's weathered from his time as a soldier working on many a different ship. He's got shoulder-length hair, a beard, and the beautiful, luxurious Eldorus, who looks akin to a raven on his shoulder. So you approach Bren to ask of what exactly needs to be done, how long you have to do it before you reach portside, and uh, Bren, if you could describe yourself. Yeah, uh, Bren is a woman, a little on the taller side, about 5'10 or 5'11, hovering about a foot or two above the ground uh, near the bow of the ship looking out. Uh, Bryn's skin is very pale, almost grayish white. Her body is gaunt. She gives almost a glow. There is a a slight uh, translucency to her form. Some of the most clear parts about her is her thick black hair tied back from her face with a braid that seems to flow back and open up down her back. And it goes from that thick black to an ethereal field of stars and in a bluish teal glow in which they float around in. Her eyes glow a bright emerald green, and that same emerald green alongside a a brilliant purple fuchsia are markings along her torso and legs and arms that flow like rivers around her body. And that's Bryn. So, Thorin, you approach uh, Bryn to ask me. Bryn, where are you right now? What are you doing? Bryn is um, surveying our approach uh, near the bow of the ship. Gotcha. So Thorin comes up. He's not trying to hide himself, he's not trying to spook you, so he comes up quietly but assuredly, and he says, Bryn. Bryn? Yes, Thorin. Sorry to disturb you. I know we're coming into the port now. How long do you suggest we have? I'd say we have about a few moments to prepare our sails. We should turn around and get ready, and be ready to be in port within the hour. Okay, I appreciate it. Is there anything I can do for you while we're getting ready? No, it's all been done. Just alert the crew and ready ourselves to prepare, and all will be well. Is there anything I can do for you, Thorin? No, love. No, love. You're fine. Uh, All right, I'll relay it back to the captain. Thank you. 
As you turn around to go find the captain moving with purpose past all of your other crew, uh, all of your fellow crew members who are quickly moving and preparing themselves to support the raising of the sails and preparing the ship to uh, be docked. You pass by Felix. Felix, what do you look like and what are you doing as the ship is preparing to dock? Felix is a young man, quite, quite tall quite pale. He is dressed in dark clothes. He's wearing a long uh, navy blue coat uh, with elegant trim. He's wearing a like a almost a, almost a witch's hat, a, 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 a pointed uh, pointed hat. I think he's rarely seen without uh, without a mask. Not uh, not that he's trying to hide his face necessarily, but just that something he likes to wear his his lips are uh, are dyed a uh, a light blue and i think at the moment he is i think he's i think he's uh sitting somewhere he is uh he is not uh not necessarily assisting the the rest of the crew directly he is um sitting somewhere in uh, maybe a bit of a shadier spot he is uh i think he has his uh his pipe kind of uh, uh, just just uh, dangling out of his mouth as he, uh, you know, he's 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 playing the hurdy gurdy right now. And he, yeah, he's uh, playing it and kind of humming along and hasn't really been been paying much attention. But uh, when he when he notices, you know, the the sort of hustle and bustle of the crew and starts to hear the, the sound of the port, I think he's I think he stands and uh, says, not really to anyone in particular, Ah, you all smell that, don't you? You all hear it, the smells and the sounds of civilization. (laughs) Been all but seawater for now, but not for much longer. Ah. Thorin walks by you, raises an eyebrow, and keeps walking. I think, Felix, as you are saying this, thinking that you're saying it to no one, I think our camera kind of is viewing you from like a profile as Thorin is passing by. And as Thorin passes, it's revealed that a second person is standing here with you, unseen by everyone else here and only heard by you. You can tell because the thick, powerful scent of tobacco and lavender is fresh in the air. You can hear the deep, almost unsettling voice that you have come to expect from your smoke spirit companion. You find yourself longing? I see. A civilization and people. Why? Do you not find comfort in those of your seafaring companions? I'm not born of the sea, my friend. I'm born of... uh... You know where you found me. <laughs> Locked away in the cage, far away from anyone else. The cage was a small uh, misstep. One of many. And many more to come. Maybe somewhere along that path you will find the right step. But for now, people and song, drink and smoke. I think he takes the pipe from you to take a drag off of it. As our camera moves away from the two of you, looking off the side of the ship at this picturesque coastline of Espanora, we move back through all of the busy crew members and into one of the doors, up the stairs of the ship and into the main cabin, following where Thorin has gone. And we find ourselves in the captain's quarters where our captain, Captain Hano, and first mate Fontaneva, and our good friend Avery Morrigan stand around the captain's desk with maps, paperwork, uh, all sorts of uh, captain paraphernalia, are looking at or looking through all of the paperwork, making sure that things are squared away to keep the ship as legal as it can possibly seem. 
uh, Thorin, you are entering at the same time. But Avery, will you tell us what you look like? Sure. So Avery is 27 years old, not quite six feet, but almost there. Somewhat tall, has sandy blonde hair. Um, his skin has gotten somewhat tan from all of his time out at sea or outside doing things um, around, like on ship decks or around um, ports. But there is definitely an air of sophistication and nobility that maybe is, you know, remiss in other parts of the ship, maybe. He's just a little bit more well-dressed, um, maybe a little bit more well-groomed than others, um, and has his ever-present satchel with a quill and papers in it, maybe a couple notebooks or a book that he's carrying with him at the time. Um, and he is just with the captain and the first mate trying to go over the different paperwork that is necessary to pass this ship off in the way they would like. You see that Captain Hano isn't necessarily... Uh, she is not doing as much of the work as you and Fontaneva are. Uh, Captain Hano is mostly sat back in her chair, foot feet up on the table, even on some of the paperwork that you have to sometimes kind of like, <laughs> like pull from underneath. And she goes, ah, sir. Oh, my bad. <laughs> and you kind of pull out from under it. Uh, Thorin, you are walking in as they are going over this paperwork. Captain Fontaneva. Oh, Mr. Alistair. I've just spoken with Bryn. We will be arriving portside within the hour. Have all the forms been gotten in order? You are most likely turning to look towards uh, both Avery and Fontaneva uh, for this more so than Captain Hano. I, I'm, I'm looking perhaps at them. I'm perhaps occasionally glaring at Captain Hana. No, oh, well, you know. Uh, Fontaneva is, uh, she is a kind of a stouter woman. She's probably somewhere around like 5'1", five, 5'2", five, broad shoulders, muscular build, definitely a working lady. Uh, she's wearing this like kind of red, white, and gold uh, like vest, like leather vest, uh, worn by time and sea traveling. Nothing under it. Also, just the vest. Uh, it is clasped in a way to not just keep it from bursting open. Uh, but she doesn't seem to really be the kind of person to care all that much about it. Uh, she's wearing these kind of like just under the knee cut uh, hemp pants uh, with like thick worn uh, working boots. She also has tattoos on either uh, on both of her arms. There's this large like black outlined like kind of rust gold dragon on uh, one of her arms and then just kind of a similar colored like spiral pattern on the other she is rough uh gruff and usually about business as you ask her that question she goes yeah more or less everything should be ready by the time we get into port as long as the captain doesn't muddy up everything with her boots she says kind of pointedly towards uh, Captain Hano, uh, who is this uh, much taller woman with black and green dyed hair, uh, a scar across one of her eyes, wearing this big old... Um, actually, she's probably not wearing her jacket. She's probably just in like kind of uh, her leisure wear, which is this uh, essentially like a leather... like a sports bra as much as a sports bra could exist in this kind of world and uh <laughs> what amounts to like uh tight fitting like pants uh with like a green sash around it she is uh, kind of picking at and polishing uh, her left hook hand as she's like sitting in uh the chair like kind of watching or listening to the two of them work and she says I won't muddy up anything that doesn't need muddying up. I'll just get out of here if that's what you need. Uh, to which Fontaneva responds, I would prefer if you worked, but uh, that's beside the point. But yes, yeah, everything should be ready by the time we uh, hit port. Excellent. And I reached like under, she'd moved her boots a second time and it's yeah. like the third page under a small stack. And like, ah, that that's the, that's the one. Okay. Uh, Perfect. I think I think everything is is in order now. Um, well, thank you, you two. Always appreciated. And Captain, if you are taking a walk anyway, won't you walk with me? Yes. I, yeah. 
sure, yeah, here I come. <laughs> and we'll like uh, get up and like start walking out and then we'll turn and says, Avery Fontaneva, you don't need anything, right? I like look at Fontaneva because I'm new to this all. Yeah, Fontaneva just <laughs> shakes her head, no. All right, so we start walking down uh, down a corridor out of out of the room that you were in, and uh, mm-hmm. Thorn kind of looks over at Captain Hanna and says, "So, now that we are, let's see, about a stone's throw away from Portside, do you want to explain to me what it is exactly your business is here?" Yes, yes, yes. Here's the deal. One of my connections uh, told me that there is a deal going down between uh, one of the, not one of the sharks, it's another one of the higher merchants up there. I think the guy's name is, uh, uh, he's some dude, uh, his name's Sergio. Sergio? I'm pretty sure he is from the the Delayton house. All right. Noble, very, very, very... uh, infatuated i guess if we want to use that word very infatuated with uh, uh pirate culture uh he has been he's a collector of sorts and apparently he has something from if you can believe it one of the old pirate lords and i don't mean like one of the last ones i mean one of the first ones real real good stuff don't know why he would be trading it but apparently he's making some deal i don't know with whom could be navy could be pirate could be just another collector not sure but if it is anything from them it's definitely worth something and probably better in our hands than blue coat or some other noble of course so you don't know who it's happening with do you know when it's happening it's happening today later today we probably have a couple of hours to scout out the place see who is around try to figure out who it's going to or we can just steal it beforehand which Personally, I think it might work better for us. I'd say that would work better. Though, if you'd like to endeavor to do a close encounter, we could follow uh, this shark of yours until he is nearly at the arrival spot. That way we can know who he was going to be delivering it to so we know who else is an interested party. That's smart. That's smart. Yeah, let's do that. All right. Who are we taking? Oh, I was, hey, I was about to ask you the same thing. Here's the thing. So, I don't know if we should take the kid. He's new. Uh, I, he's, Obviously. He's wet, he's, he's wet around the ears. Or green around the ears? Is that what people say? Green around the gills. Green around the gills. I like that. That's better. Green around the gills. There you go. He's a bit of a, you know, silk shirts. They're not really... He's a good young lad. He just needs to get some grit under his nails. I agree. Uh, I think he should stay on the ship. Uh, he'll be good with Fontaneva for now. Yeah, I agree. I don't want him mucking up anything either. So great. That's one person we're not taking, love. Who are we taking? <laughs> okay, look, I just... Okay, look, I think we can keep this small. I think me, I you... Agree. We can maybe take, if he's interested, Felix. I can ask him. Yeah. Um, we can take Felix... I mean, if Bryn would like to come along, she's more than welcome, though. I know she feels more comfortable on the ship. True. All right. Okay, look, if you go ask Felix, I'll get a couple of uh, the guys. I can ask Bryn, uh, or you can ask Bryn, whoever, I don't care. I just saw both of them. They're on my track back. How about this? Why don't you talk to Avery and Fontaneva and see how they want to navigate this? Okay. I can talk to the others. Yeah, that's fine. I just... <sighs> I don't know about that kid. Why did you bring him on board if you're so stressed about it? This was your decision. Look, all right, the 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 legal cover he gives us is great. Like, I mean, you cannot beat being one of, you know, a ship a ship with the Billingsley Trainings Company. No one's going to question. Better yet, we might get better a better port spot to get out of there faster just because he's with us. Well, then I guess we better make sure that he's got his best little bow tie on and up front, though, don't we? Get him to the front of the ship. All right. Regardless of whether he comes or not. Sure. I'll be sure he plays his part. You take care of the others. I'll take care of him. Will do. Be nice. Yeah, you too. And we'll turn and walk. I am nice. (laughs) (laughs) I'm always nice. Yeah, she'll turn and walk back, uh... Into the room of Fontaneva and Avery as yeah, you head and off. And Eldorus does a little squawk at her. 
<laughs> I think uh, from one of her pockets, she takes out like what is like fractionally more than dust of <laughs> of like leftovers of bread and will like flick it over towards Eldorus. Eldorus will not bother. One of these days. <laughs> one of these days. You're gonna like me. <laughs> this is bug we're talking about. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh and she turns and walks away as you uh head over to Bryn and uh in, in Felix's direction. Uh our camera stays with her as she enters back into uh, the captain's quarters and says all right, so, two of you, here's the plan. Once we get into port, Avery, I need you to put your best smile on. We need you to get us past every dock hand, every manager, just work your magic. Can you do that? Absolutely. I mean, I, I have the, the documents are here, and I have all of uh, our, our full story. Is, it's, it's right here. It's it's It's... Wonderful, wonderful. We should be fine. Yeah, don't need to run me through it. I just need to make sure that it is set, ready to go. Of course. Fontaneva, I'm having you watch over the kid, okay? And uh, uh, Fontaneva I... goes, wait, no, I'm coming. He's like, no, nah, you, you'll be on the ship. Uh, we par can handle Pardon, pardon. Am I, yeah. am I, am I the kid in in question here? I can take care of myself. I, I'm I not, don't okay, need look, kid. Listen. I know you can take care of I... <laughs> Avery, I know you can take care of yourself. I know that you're an adult. You can do whatever you want. But I'm also saying you're staying on the ship. Fontaneva's watching over you to make sure that you don't get into any trouble. I know that you were... I never... Look, I just don't... This is your first time, all right? It is very different being on this end of a blue coat skaze. It is very, very different. And I need you to understand that because they are going to push and prod you until you break. And I need to know that you're not going to break. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I won't. Okay. Good. Montenegro is going to make sure you won't. Just this once. Just to make sure. It's your first time. I want to make sure that you're calm, comfortable, collected, and won't fuck this up for us. All right? No pressure. Huh? No pressure. All right. Fontaneva, watch over him. And Fontaneva's like, wait, but I, fuck. And <laughs> the captain just storms off. I, I just give Fontaneva a very apologetic look of like, I had nothing to do with this. No, like, this, no, no, this isn't your fault. She's just, <sighs> all right. Don't make this hard for me. It's just, uh, I won't. I, yeah. is, is there something I, sh I should know about? Is, is there history here with this port or? It's, <sighs> it's history everywhere. I don't know how much the captain told you about anything that we do or anything like that. But the fact of the matter is, most of us here are wanted criminals. And the smallest, and I mean the smallest, mistake could mean any number of our lives. Not to mention, if fighting breaks out, they don't quite care who they shoot, as long as they kill us. Understood. We need to make sure that if all hell breaks loose, that you're on our side. Of course. Uh, under understood. Shouldn't be a problem then. And we'll like give you like a, a little too hard of a slap on the back. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we cut back over to Thorin as you are approaching Felix and Bren. All right. Uh, question for Felix real quick. How long has Felix been on the ship? Have I worked with Felix a few times? Um, I think so. I don't think he's, okay. he's, he's still definitely newer uh, than. Right than most of the crew but um but 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 yeah he's he's been there for we've had a few rider dies yeah probably been around for a couple of months at this point a couple of months yeah okay that being said i'm gonna run into felix first because that makes sense in the order from last time sure so are you still smoking your pipe over the railing felix what else do i do of course I am. right you hear a caw above you. And on the air, you see Eldorus gliding, which can only mean that Thorin is not far behind, unless, of course, you have some treats in your pocket. She comes down and acts like she's going to perch herself on your smoking hand. Do you let her? Uh... 
Yes. Yeah, I think he does. This big bird <laughs> comes down onto your smoking hand, and she looks at you with big eyes, caws, and then pecks your pipe a few times. And as that's happening and you're trying to process that, behind you, you're Ildor, Ildorus. She looks back at Thorn and leaves your pipe to sit on her perch again on Thorn's shoulder. Ah, Felix, she, uh, she really likes that pipe of yours. Uh, I guess you get the good stuff, don't you? Felix, uh, Felix addresses, uh, the bird and says, I will have to, uh, procure you one of your own someday, my lady. Thorin, what's, uh, what's, what, what word from, from below? Uh, as you can expect, I don't know why the captain always finds it within herself to not tell me the details of what we're doing until we're almost there, but so be it. There is going to be a transfer of some item that has, it has some connection to the old lords, the very old lords. We're going to need to scout out one named Sergio, apparently someone who has shark ties. Are you familiar? Mm, Sergio, Sergio, Sergio. The name doesn't ring a bell. Yeah, it didn't for me either. I figured I'd give it a shot. We'll relay more details once the captain comes around, but our mission is to retrieve the item before the handoff happens, but not before we can see who it is he's delivering it to. I see, I see. A little bit of, uh, a little bit of cloak and dagger, perhaps. A little bit of, uh, this sounds, this sounds delightful. Who all is coming? It's you, me, Hana. And whoever else Hano wants to bring along. But, I'll be honest, the last few times we've worked together, I'll be leaning on you. I trust you to keep your eyes forward and know what's happening, when it's happening, and how we should go forward. I appreciate you for that. And you get another little caw from Eldorus. And Eldorus does appreciate that too as well, it would seem. Felix, like, does a a small little, like, bow to Eldorus. And she nods. Ah, and of course I'm a fool. I'm about to go speak to Bryn as well. I was thinking so much about speaking with her. I, yeah. Bryn will be coming with us as well. And that's who I have to be off to now. Would you like to go with me, or... Of course, is, uh... Stay to yourself. Is Avery not coming? <sighs> not that I think it would be, a, a, a exceptionally wise idea but don't you think it would be fun to get a little blood and grime on that boy's hands i think you need to watch what you smoke though he does need perhaps a little roughing up as he put earlier i wasn't in the room for that conversation <laughs> <I didn't> <laughs> uh, <laughs> as i could imagine he would put earlier <laughs> as i imagine what happened right imagine. after i left <laughs> You know that boy is a full-grown adult, but he lacks experience in certain areas. The time will come when it's right. Whether that's this time, the next time, I don't know. It's ultimately up to Captain Hano. But for now, at the very least, he's good for image. On to Bryn, aren't we? Off with us then. Um, I think as you guys kind of start to shuffle up and like try and like get moving, Bryn uh, starts like comes back to the main deck. And is is moving towards you too, actually, coming to make time to ready the ship to tie sails and prepare for moving more directly into port. Um, and Bryn kind of moves next to you guys, still floating, um, and raises her hand up a little ways as if to invite Aldo uh, Eldoris if she is willing. Eldoris sees your spectral perch and is delighted. She comes and rests on your hand and gives a little head to the side action. Bryn takes a singular index finger and like runs it over like the top of Eldoris's like back. She leans in like a cat. <laughs> um, just kind of like still like keeping that hand up, like looks over um, the two of you and is like, well, we have got to ready ourselves to enter port. 
Do we have word from our captain? I've spoken with the captain. It is as it usually is. There is always side shenanigans, and we are always first pick for that party. So, and then relays, I imagine, the exact same thing that's been explained twice now. <laughs> um, what, I, what, I would, what I would imagine is Bryn smiles um, and is like, I do appreciate you sharing your thoughts and the plans with me, but don't ever forget, I have ears throughout this ship, and I hear many things. That's what I know. That's why I don't worry about giving you the full lowdown. You already have it, don't you? Mm, bits and pieces. It comes bits and goes. Bits and pieces. Bits and pieces. Um, however, and, and Bryn like, kind of gives like a side eye. is like, Felix, you seem so eager to be portside. I'd imagine you wouldn't mind giving a hand with Thorin at the capstan? I suppose. I suppose. Wonderful, beautiful. Um, I believe we should ready ourselves to tie sails. Already on it. Lad's already on it. I can manage. Um, and, uh, I believe Bryn kind of, like, motions with her hand to kind of, uh, like, let Eldorus hop back onto your shoulder. Mm -hmm. Um, where is our captain again? Uh, the captain has, uh, come out of the, uh, hallway leading to her quarters and has, uh, come all the way up towards, uh, the ship's, uh, standing up there by the ship's helm, uh, with the, uh, the helmsman. Bryn, uh, goes up the balustrade up the stairs to the helm and upon getting close to captain stops floating and plants her feet on the ground and, 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 uh, walks to the captain as captain. I'm able to tie the sails in a moment if need be. Are we ready? Well, uh, you see, like, as you, like, uh, talk to her, uh, she gives you a light smile and, like, a nod, Lady Bryn. Yeah, do, uh, yeah, do whatever you need to do. Tie those sails. Love watching you work. There, I believe there's, like, a space between the railing and the actual wheel. Um, and uh, in, embedded in that place there is a sort of, dark stone with pieces of glowing fragments, almost looking like it's uh, a shattered stone that's being held together by some kind of, like, spectral energy. Um, and Bryn goes and puts um, both of her hands on it, trying to commune with the ship. Everyone, steady yourselves and prepare for the sails to be raised. Um, and the ship grows cold for a moment, eerily chill. The boards start to creak, and the sails start to shift in color, and the sails become almost a field of stars, and the, all the ties and the ropes holding them are mixtures of the, the same turquoise, tealish, and fuchsia, that's found on Bryn's markings. And Bryn's skin is also this celestial field of stars. Her whole form, aside from those, those markings and her eyes, um, which are all glowing with, with immense brightness, the ties seemingly untie themselves, and the sails begin to roll up, and the, the ropes tie them off. And for a moment, the ship is, seems almost still. And within the same moment, it grows warm again. The sun seems almost brighter, and Bryn's skin and the sails are back to as they were. There's a moment of silence on the Bois Perdu as everyone on the crew watches in amazement as this magnificent, mystical, arcane act happens. It's not the first time they have seen it, but it doesn't make it any less miraculous every time. And as the sails tie themselves off, your ship is just in sight of a white stone building that reaches high above the canals of Puerto Eliminado. A watery path carves the fort in two as the main canal flows through this enormous former fort allowing for ease of access into and out of the structure from the docks flanking the canal. 
From high above, water flows through decorative channels, past crowded clay walkways, bustling market stalls, and exclusive gathering areas. Palm trees, standing tables, and food courts now stand where forges, cannons, and barracks once were. The air in here is thick with sweet-smelling incense, creating this kind of atmosphere and luxury. And it's also mixed with the salty, savory smells of foods and grills far up in the market stalls, filling this place with this sense of liveliness, a sense of civilization, as Felix dared call it. And as you all are pulling up, you all are waved in by one of the deckhands who kind of find you all a spot in the port as you pass by all of these other ships. Avery, I imagine you and uh, first mate uh, Fontaneva ha are up front along the side of the ship, uh, kind of helping navigate exactly which spot in the port you all will be taking. And uh, once you do find this spot, you lower anchor. Oh no no no! We can get and... we can get much closer. We can get much closer. That's that's no. Why would we Why would we park here? We should go much closer to the port. Absolutely, we can take that spot. I imagine one of the deck hands has. Uh, he's got this really long pole that he uses to vault over the space in between uh, the canal and the ship to be able to actually get onto the ship. Uh, and he just kind of has it over his shoulder as he's been trying to direct you. Uh, and as you say that, he's like, what? No, uh, no, this spot is just fine. This is our regular, this is the regular spot, the one that's open, you know. Uh, but we are with the Billingsley Trading Company. I, I obviously thought that there would be a much more... Uh, you say that and his eyes kind of open. He says, oh, I, sorry, I didn't realize. Okay. And like looks over the paperwork that you've handed him again and goes, oh, well, uh, my my mistake uh please and will very loudly oh no, no trouble whatsoever i just i didn't want a mistake to happen oh no of course no we most certainly wouldn't want to make a mistake with uh, uh one of the esteemed guests uh, such as yourselves uh, please and we'll call out very loudly uh, they'll be taking the spot over there in the vip section they uh, help direct you in a much uh, a primer spot uh, for you all. In fact, uh, you find yourselves um, pulling up uh, to this spot that's uh, very close to uh, one of the exits uh, and right next to what is uh, this large uh, kind of marketplace uh, that is behind like a silk rope on the like actual like walking side of the port where it seems like people would need some kind of special access to even get to the side of the marketplace where you all are pulling up to. Uh, and that is where you lower anchor and uh, they have the boarding. Uh, you all like let out the, the boarding walk. The, the gangplank? Gangplank, thank you. I'm sorry, I, I don't know a lot of boat terms i don't I, i'm surprised that i know these many <laughs> uh yes you all let out uh, the gang uh the gang plank uh to you know allow yourselves to be able to walk on and off uh of the ship onto uh the deck uh captain um calls uh the three of you bryn thorin and felix uh up to her as well as was there someone else that was going with you all i don't think so i think that was it avery if you're around uh Oh yeah, Avery, you are around. You see the captain calling these three up to kind of get like a little, to get a little huddle going on over here. As uh, other crew members are starting to go on and off the ship, getting ready to party as it seems. Uh, this place is bustling with people, food and things to do. Avery um, looks over at the, the, the group gathering of like the, the, the in members basically and just kind of like sighs a little bit. Nothing that he's not used to, though, um, and just yeah. goes back to looking over the paperwork and, like, drilling things that he's pretty sure are going to come up. But he was feeling very confident beforehand and then got the stern talking to and now is like, shit, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm not going to be OK at this. Yeah. Uh, as you're going over the paperwork, you see Fontaneva, who's staying behind with you, is calling off to all the other people. Don't stray too far from the ship, you lot. I don't want any trouble out of any of you. If any of you end up in shackles, you're on your own. 
and you hear people calling back, ah, yeah, whatever, <laughs> and, go, and going on. Uh, and then, yeah, cutting back over to uh, the little uh, in-crowd huddle over here, the captain goes, <sighs> Bryn, Felix, I imagine that Thorin uh, briefed you all on the whole deal? Oh, yes. Always do. All right, cool. So we're all in. First order of business, we got to find this Sergio fella. Uh, I'm sure if we ask around, uh, folks like him, they like throwing money. I'm sure he's not quiet about it. I don't want to stay in port long after we've completed our caper. Oh, absolutely not. Can I just real quick ask? Yeah. With us coming into port in Espinora, I want to just make sure, I just want to like slight Rick on, I've, I've had that whole conversation with the person on, at the port in Espinoran. Oh, of course. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just want to double check. All right, cool. So you don't know where he's staying then? <sighs> Chances are he's probably in the premier lounges on the top floor. Right. Got to find our way up there, of course, but I'm sure we can find a way to blend in. Well, Felix is well-dressed. The rest of us might need to polish up a little bit. Oh, what? I'm fine. She says, just wearing a sports bra on her pants. I'm fine. I can throw a jacket on. Make myself look the part. Well, you can be the distraction, then. Felix says, Am I not distracting enough for you, Thorin? I could be more distracting, if you wish. Uh, I'm good. All right. We're going to the Premier Lounge. What are the VIP suites? Hi. And, uh, I guess, hmm, Thorn, you and I, we can try to find our way into the suites if uh, Bryn and Felix want to see if they can possibly find our buyer. And how are they going to go about that? I don't know. You know even less about the buyer than you do the... Okay, I was just... Okay, yeah, no, we can all go together. I just figured... Could split. Maybe okay. Maybe bad move. Fine. I, look. Okay. I'm more of a do person. More. I'm a, more of a doing person. You know. I'm well aware. To the premiere, then, friends. To the premiere. Spray some perfume, and put on a happy face. We've got the bourgeoisie to deal with. Mm. Felix goes mm, and cracks his knuckles. You see, Bren like trying to like smile like a few times and just like not happening not happening no very fair very fair so as the four of you uh set off trying to find your way towards the premier area avery while you are uh on the ship uh here with fontaneva just kind of uh looking around you do notice that uh despite the fact that you all are in the vip area or maybe because of you notice the crew, as they're all coming off, are getting a lot of eyes. Something about your anxiety has probably made you a bit more um, vigilant, I would imagine. And as you're looking around, you do notice that on basically every corner around here, there is Union Navy about. Uh, you can tell that they're Union Navy because they're wearing their uh, typical blue and silver getup each of them with their union-supplied saber and side arm. Things that you've become quite familiar with, especially with your connections with them. Would I know where Garen is stationed? Or is that a constant question? I think you know that Garen is not stationed uh, within Espinoran territory. Garen, uh, upon the suggestion of your father... Uh, is stationed in Union territory near the Holy Marvellian Empire. Many, many leagues away from where you are now. Okay, just make sure. Of course. As the four of you are walking off the ship and around, this place is a buzz with activity. I mean, this is a merchant's inn. This is where everyone comes to trade, uh, especially people from nearby Ziegenland, uh, other places uh, within Espinora, and then the Marvellian Empire. Uh, this is the closest island uh, off the coast of mainland Espinora. There are many different people here from all over, all speaking a variety of their native tongues, and all of them are kind of high off the luxury of being in a place such as this. 
which one of you do you think are the most accustomed to just ship watching? I think that's obviously Bren. I think Bren has a keen eye, just preve- like preventing like the the dock and and keeping track of what ships are there and kind of keeping tabs on where things are. But also like kind of being enamored with each one's different like structure and details. Of course. You, as you all are walking, are probably just looking off to the side uh, along the uh, the two docks uh, flanking the canal, uh, just taking a look at some of the ships. And you see, you know, uh, you're you're looking at different merchant ships, at different fishing ships, uh, people who have come in to either trade their goods or buy things. But you do notice one ship. You spot the slim schooner uh, pulling into the port. Uh, it is just now raising its flags to slow down uh, and be able to uh, find a spot to lower anchor. Its flags, you notice, are a, a gradient of colors, almost uh, starting at the very top being this bright yellow, then as it moves down, slowly becoming more orangish and then more purple, almost like a sunrise or sunset of some kind. And you see the symbol on the flags is this palette, uh, kind of a painter's palette with a rainbow of colors on it in a uh, paintbrush lying perpendicular to it. It is the symbol of a well-known and somewhat infamous fleet of pirate ships known as the Painted Fleet. Ugh. Upon seeing this, are we still on the docks? Yeah. I think Bryn, as they're walking, Bryn peers over at the ship and takes a moment to kind of note a lot of like the details of it um, and to remember its placement in the dock and keep track of it in her mind, just in case. And continues walking alongside the rest. Do you tell anyone? No. No. Rude. (laughs) Okay. So yeah, you all continue walking. And as you make your way up the... As you make your way off of the docks onto the clay pathways of this large merchant's inn, taking the stairs upwards towards the top floor, you all find yourselves constantly assaulted with the sounds and smells of all of these different foods and people and merchants calling out, trying to sell their goods. It is a cacophony of stimuli. What's your move, gang? Where do you, where do you go first? Who who do you try to talk to? What's the, what's the plan here? Captain, what does this bloke look like? He's, if I'm remembering correctly, he's a Delayton possibly dragon mark so look for scales or a tail or something all right now that we're here i say we split up as we're kind of an eyesore of a bunch go to opposing corners look for people that have indications of being dragonborn if you see something come back to this spot and periodically others be looking at this spot to see if anyone has come back If you find no one within 10 minutes, return. Does anyone else want to add or detract anything from this plan? The one thing I have is I wonder what sort of business do these people have in the city? Um, Where do they have their fingers dipped into, so to speak? Captain? Well, Sergio, he's a merchant of sorts, I imagine. Probably has a shop around here. Most of the big ones do. Uh, I don't know if he makes his residence here on this specific island or or not. Uh, It's hard to say. Could be one of the bathhouses. Could be... Could be one of the grills. I don't know. I know he's a collector of sorts, so... Anywhere where we can find trinkets, uh, it's possible. Collector of what, may I ask? Artifacts? Gold, jewels, as many things to collect. Eldorus perks up at the sound of trinkets. <laughs> He's a pirate collector. So, yeah. Well, we both have no interest in bubbles or knickknacks. I imagine that we... I can search more spiritually inclined mm-hmm. and see the information of any artifacts that may have been trafficked through this area. Of course. I will... <laughs> Check the bathhouses. Rich 
fat, plump folks like him love soaking themselves before they do business. That's rude. All right, I'm parting ways. Don't forget to meet back here in ten minutes whether you find anything or not. We do not want to be here longer than we need to be. Ten minutes, you say? Yes. Oh, that should be more than enough time. That's what I'm saying. Off. Let's go. Yes, you all... You all search the, uh, dark corners of the city, and I... And he, like, uh, Felix, like, looks to the, like, bustling streets, and just says, I'll be scanning a little bit of a larger crowd. With any luck, we'll see. All right. So the four of you break off, and we return back to Avery, sitting here with his books and papers out here on the deck of the ship. You see, uh, Fontaneva is uh, sitting on one of the barrels uh, of the ship, doing a little bit of uh, a wood carving. Uh, she has a dagger out and uh, is whittling it into uh, who knows what. It's very early in its stages. You're here. You're watching uh, ships uh, pull in, pull out, people off of the ship out in the little market square, like looking at all of the different uh, stalls and stuff, trying some of the food, having a good time. I like look over at Fontaneva and like the wood carving and it's like, it's quiet between like everybody on, like whatever is going on on the ship is way in the background. It's just like very quiet here, bustling happening out on the whatever. And I just am like, what, what, what you carving? I haven't decided yet. I kind of figure out its shape about halfway through. I have a sibling that does wood carving. It's kind of what they've said as well. Really? To find the piece in the wood. Let its soul bear itself to you? Something like that. I don't know if wood has soul or identity or anything like that, but... On a ship like this, you don't think that? <laughs> On a ship like this. Wood is wood. Might be special wood, might be magic wood. It's wood. You are entitled to your opinions. I, I am. As are you. What do you think? Would have a soul? I'm not willing to rule it out. But I'd rather... I'd, 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 Fontenay, I'd really rather... Could we just go get some food? Or something? Do we have to stay on the ship the whole time? Captain said you're not to leave the ship. You're not to leave the ship. What about the, the direct vicinity of the ship? You could see me from the deck. I just, I just would, would love to try some of the... I just, you know... No, I, it's, fi it's fine. It's fine. I don't have to do anything. I will sit and look pretty and do nothing. If you would like, it sounds like you're trying to parlay. Do tell. Parlay move. When you parlay with an interested party, offer something and roll plus polish. Plus polish, huh? Yeah. You have anything you want to offer? I just like. I just like. Could also be hoodwink. Could also be hoodwink if you're lying to her. I'm not lying to her. Avery's yeah. bored. Wants to do something. Uh, I think Avery just like takes out a little pouch of coin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So you pull out a little pouch of coins. I'm not coins. like offering it to her, but I'm like, like I have, we could, we could spend a little bit of money. Okay. Make the, make the parlay with that. Okay. So I rolled the, the 2d6 plus my, sorry, which one, polish. Mm -hmm. All right. That is a seven. Okay. On a seven to nine, they want to see you uphold your end of the bargain first, or they change the terms the fate decides. She, uh, as you kind of like, just kind of like, I'm imagining like tossing the, the, the pouch kind of lackadaisically, almost nonchalantly, she looks up and then back down to her wood and says, you know, I could find myself distracted in this for quite a while. Something about wood carving is just so enthralling. Mm, mm, yes. Really, really digging into what the wood wants from you as well as yeah obviously uh is there anything you you know theoretically would desire in the port as well 
perhaps you're so distracted with that thought that, you know. Hmm. I... I hear that they have really good kebabs here. Mm. And I would go out and get one, but as you heard, the captain says, I gotta stay on the ship. Woe is us. Woe is us. How enthralling this wood is. <laughs> and I just, I'm having this conversation, and I'm like standing up and walking toward the gangplank. It's, it's truly a shame. I, 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 Mm -hmm. I absolutely understand. Yeah, and she's just still and I'm carving like walking the wood. Down just still backwards. Carving the wood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So I, I I get off of the ship and I'm gonna take a look around at the stalls just immediately in the vicinity. See yeah. some, you see, some yeah, it's primarily stuff. a lot of like really, really good food. You see, there 100% is this place uh, that... Don't get kind uh, of started on the food again, please. No, I'm going to do it. Uh, you asked for this. Uh, it's <laughs> uh, so uh, you see that um, one you of did. the big places here in this market stall is this, like... They have this huge rotisserie, like, meat uh, that is, like, uh, on... Uh, <laughs> That is, Are you uh, talking that is, like the shaved meat where they like bring yeah yeah the yeah, yeah. that's what yeah. I'm about to yeah. There's this huge stack of meat that is collected uh, on this pipe and is being just slowly rotated by two of the workers here on either side over this huge flame pit. You can smell as uh, juices of it dripping, falling into the fire, sizzling. This salty, savory smell. Uh, emanating from it. There's like this huge crowd of people around it, all of them like calling out to the person at the front of the stall who is like taking orders as quickly as they can. They probably got like two or three people. Um, you see quite a few of the crew members uh, of your ship are also here. Uh, they don't see you though. They are too enthralled and like all of them trying to get an order in. Uh, there's also some other ones. Uh, you see uh, that there is this place uh, over to the side that's selling like kind of like roasted quail and like beds of uh, long grain rice um, with like herbs and spices uh, kind of topped along it. And like there's just like the smorgasbord of delicious Espanoran uh, cuisine here. And... Yeah, that's the food in the immediate vicinity. Great. Yeah, Avery absolutely goes and gets some of, like, the shaved meat, some, like, mm -hmm. paella-like food as well. I would imagine that there's something delicious like that. There's this place that essentially has, like, a huge, not communal pot, but it is, like, big enough to, like, people can come and grab whatever they need. Like, huge, uh, huge things of rice and shrimp and lobster with the aroma of, like, it, the saffron aroma where, it, like, it just smells like the sea. Mm, so good. Yeah, so Avery grabs some of that and is eating it as he looks around the market a little bit. He's on the lookout for anything with, like, some cute trinkets or books or anything um jewelry yeah. maybe yeah. even i mean this place so. has everything you can find a stall for all of these things i i think avery you were just walking back and forth kind of window shopping mm -hmm. at all these different places and i think as you're doing this um you notice that one of the ships that uh, most recently docked uh, a bunch of people have come off it and are carrying like crates and stuff as is usual here uh coming from the ship that Bryn noticed earlier. And these are a wild looking group of people. They kind of stand out. Each of them has their own particular kind of style of dress. None of them feel like they fit in any kind of cultural clothing that you've seen before. Like they don't necessarily look Belanusian. They don't necessarily look Marvellan or Espanoran or anything like that. It feels like, it feels like all of these people got dressed in the dark. You see, like, just smash, like, colors smash together. None of them go together. Uh, you see some of them are wearing, like, pants with one uh, with one leg sleeve shorter than the other. Uh, what, uh, some of them are wearing, like, ripped off sleeves. All of them kind of have splotches of um, paint or clay or charcoal. All of them look just wild. 
um, and you see them like kind of going. And I think what happens is like two of them have this huge box, like crate that they're carrying down the uh, down the marketplace, and they like bump into you, and like one of them goes, "Ah, watch where you watch where you're standing," as they're uh, making their way past you. What language does he say that in? Marvellan. Okay. I would just uh, move out of the way. Part, part of me, I, uh, and I'll like try to get a look at whatever they're carrying, which was uh, just a large crate. Yeah, you said? it's yeah, it's a large crate. It has a symbol on the side. It's the same symbol that Bryn saw on their flags before. It is this uh, rainbow-colored painter's palette with a brush uh, perpendicular to it. And as you like, kind of get out of the, get out of the way, and they're passing you by. We are gonna cut over to Felix. Felix, you said you were doing some people watching. What's going on? Oh, more than that. In Felix's mind, the best way to people watch is to well, get a lot of people and uh, watch them. Uh, so Felix is going to uh, uh, put on a put on a mask. The particular mask he is wearing is traditionally used uh, to represent a, uh, a, a priest of the, uh, of the Church of the First Song. And he wears it, uh, he wears it upside down. Ooh. And, um... What does this mask look like, if I can ask? I imagine... I don't know much about the Church of the First Song, but I just imagine, like, for it, for it being, um, you know, uh, priest... I'm imagining it's, uh... It's like white and like maybe a little yeah. gold, uh, mm, like white gold trim yes, around it. Yeah, very much, very much like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think uh, I think Felix looks for like not not a not a not a not a huge. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't need much of a stage, but ju- just some something to stand on. If even like a a yeah. rock or a, a barrel or something. Something to <laughs> elevate him a little bit, and uh, as he's uh, standing there, he begins uh, playing just like a like a drone on his uh, on his hurdy gurdy, and uh, starts he <laughs> he starts singing in a very very broken Havanish, uh, very uh, uh, very crude language uh he, he just and is just singing like i imagine like what he is singing translates as like oh song and glory and divinity and light and song and <laughs> <So good>. creation <laughs> he's just saying words <laughs> yes just like saying words that's so good yeah no um you 100 percent do start catching eyes like people are like who's this who's this asshole yeah (laughs) and like there are people who like start like kind of standing around because they're interested in like if this is they don't see like a hat out as like you're like trying to like as if you're like trying to like busk uh they Uh just see you doing this and so they're like confused like is this gonna be a thing like some of them, I imagine there's probably like a handful of Marvellan people who are familiar with the traditional form of uh-huh. what this mask is supposed to be used for. And so they're kind of like, what? What is this? Um, in doing this, you also get a few eyes from Union naval officers who are around, mm-hmm. who like you see, like as like people are like starting to go like cross their arms, like watching to see. You obviously hear like off in the corner somewhere. You hear some people like, "Boo, you stink! That's the worst singing I've ever heard." <laughs> uh, very, uh, very uh, fable, <laughs> fable one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like so. people <laughs> responses. Um, Felix. Uh... Res- responds to that he 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 calls back out to the uh the hecklers uh still 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 with this uh with this mask on he uh he he proclaims oh but don't don't let the choir hear you speaking ill of their beautiful song <laughs> oof 
Are you are you trying to do a specific move here? Are you or are you Not just trying really. to get some eyes? Okay, I'm cool. just trying to get some eyes. Yeah, no, you've definitely got people's attention. You see that there are some members of the Union Navy here who have like kind of started to like walk over, arms crossed, looking at you a little oddly, trying to figure out if you are a problem that needs to be taken care of. Yeah, as as he sees them approaching he does like a quick mask change i don't really know how he does it it's a trade secret anyway um it's like a sleight of hand where it's like it's a sleight of hand, hand like mo- hand moves over face and it's a different mask yeah and he he changes it to like kind of a just a neutral i think it's just like a neutral black mask mm-hmm. which is i think just like the the default and yeah. uh and he and he says, friends, 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 please. Just a bit of just a bit of playful fun. Come now. I I know I know you officers can still have a little fun, can't you? You're disturbing the peace, vagrant. Be off with you. Oh, peace, 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 yeah. It's all very peaceful around here. That's all what they all say about hustling, bustling port cities. It's all peace, isn't it? All right, are you looking to start trouble? And you trouble. see, like, they're, like, starting to go for, like, their clubs. Trouble, trouble. Felix takes a uh, uh, a puff of his pipe and says, No trouble here. And I'm going to use... Yeah, I'm going to use my Dark Magician move. Ooh, okay. Please read this move out for us. Yes, when you wish to evoke one of your demonic powers... Spend luck and roll plus Spitfire uh, on a six or below your demon takes control, uh, and then we will 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 you know uh, let's let's just roll first. Yeah, let's roll. Uh, okay, that is a seven. Okay, awesome. On a seven and nine, I'll roll one d six to determine which of your powers you're going to get and can take one harm to add or subtract one to the result. So if it becomes something that you, you know, don't want, but you want one that's either one higher or one lower than it, you can take harm to choose that thing instead. Yes. All right. I got three. Uh, For a scene, you may create a chittering flying shadow servant who does your bidding. Okay. Yeah. I think what happens is he um, exhales the smoke. You know what? The, the smoke takes the form of like a like a giant centipede that is oh. like that is like hovering through the air. Okay. Bad news. You do that, and all of like the 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 crowd that is gathered around like looks up in shock and awe, and they're gasping. Oh my goodness! Oh, oh my god! And like a few of them like run because they see this, and you see like you've shocked uh, the the two guards while everyone is distracted. Uh huh. This is this is where Felix starts. Like actually, he is scanning the crowd. Uh. Okay. Awesome. And he's looking for because which talking, wasn't a possibility before. <laughs> Only right now. He, uh, yeah, because 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 you said we're looking for like someone. You called them dragon touched. Uh, so dragon marked is a term used for certain members of Espinor nobility, those of which who, within their bloodline, uh, harness the essence of dragon blood, uh, gifted to their houses centuries ago and because of that they manifest some draconic some draconic aspects this may be scales this may be specific eyes this may be teeth or or tails and this will range from different people some only have some like small almost unnoticeable aspects while some people have very very noticeable aspects of them yeah so I, th- I think Felix is looking for that, but also like, mm-hmm. also just like anything else that may be inter- just like anything. He's looking for anything interesting. Of course, uh, as you're doing that, everybody's in. Uh, everybody's shocked. You've caught the blue coats off guard, uh, and all of these other people off guard. Some people running, some people not. 
as you're scanning the crowd, trying to uh, see any sign of anyone who might be dragon marked, you do notice there is this figure, tall, probably about six feet, six two, kind of lean build, uh, walking past, and you notice uh, as they are passing by, as like someone's like running past them, you uh, get a quick look. Uh, and uh, you get a quick look at their face and you see it's kind of gaunt and scaly and they have blue reptilian eyes that kind of flash uh, in, that kind of flash at you right before they turn around, look away and continue moving uh, towards the stairs leading further up. And from that, we are going to cut over to Bryn. Yeah, so Bryn... I think when we parted ways, Bryn kind of dipped behind some stalls and took a moment to wrap their arms with like a thin cloth, like almost like bandage wraps up all the way through um, her arms. And she kind of let down uh, the the sort of robes that she was wearing and the kind of was like a plumy, flowy, long uh, trousers. Um and she closes her jacket or vest to cover her chest and throws a hood over her head with a veil that covers the top half of her face. And she returns back to the market, kind of keeps her head down as she walks through, looking for any stalls that may have connections to, you know, other sorts of spiritual spiritual believers or like other religions or like groups of people who like are you know, connected to these things. Yeah. As you are looking around, you do see that there is a particular shop here. Um, It is a small market stall. Not a lot of people really kind of coming around it. You see that the person behind it is this uh, shorter woman uh, with like light brown curly hair. Um, She's wearing this kind of, fine looking like silk gown with a a pearl necklace and uh like (laughs) silver bangles uh around her wrists and she is sitting in a stool behind this stall and you see that the stall is like what you would see as being kind of a hodgepodge of religious iconography and trinkets and what mostly amounts to be inauthentic baubles of like various Belenusian religions and and beliefs. There is like nothing cohesive. It, like you're saying like, you know, wooden dolls and like uh, ceremonial candles and like jewelry and like all of this other stuff with like the kind of stuff that people that you would have known growing up would have held in very high regard that is now a not actually that stuff and b like being sold here yeah being commodified here in a way that is completely disconnected from any original context um i think bren stands there for a moment and is kind of a little saddened for a moment and thinks about how she misses the people and the the days spent and the rituals of being back home and how not having that like uh, routine of things has grown isolating. But Bryn reluctantly walks up um, and kind of still like looking at the ground is speaking to the person running the, the stall. Oh, you also have an interest still people of Belenusha. Are you uh, speaking to her in Marvellan? Uh, is she Marvellan? Uh, I would imagine... She, no, no, I would say Marvellan, yes. I think Bryn speaks yeah, Marvellan yeah. here. Yeah. You, uh, you hear that this person kind of speaks back to you in a broken Marvellan uh, with a, like an Espinoran accent. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, many good stuff. Lots of good stuff from there. Candles to 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 burn at night and say your prayers to the many uh, many strange uh, gods. Gods to protect you, of course. Uh, uh, or or um, doll. Uh, we have a doll of uh, a visage of a goddess. 
put under if you put it under your pillow, you uh, find yourself uh, good dreams, no more nightmares. Oh, I could use something like that. Yes, yes, very cheap, very cheap. More you, I take you for someone of high regard, and you've cultivated such great artifacts of Belanusha. Do you have anything a bit more specialized? Specialized. Um, 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 uh, uh, and she will like kind of go like in like the bottom part behind the stall and says, uh, 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 ah, yes, 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 something good for you. And we'll uh, take out a small little chest. Uh, it's this uh, simple wooden chest uh, with uh, iron detailing on it. We'll uh, take a key, unlock it, open it, and there is a locket in there. Uh, it is like a, a brass locket with a fine detailing on it and on uh, the kind of uh, image carved into the main core of this locket is uh, like a compass rose. It's this belong to Captain, Belanusian Captain. Really? Yes. May I? And like, uh, like holds out a singular hand. Um, she will be very, she's like a little hesitant at first and then we'll hand it off to you. As it enters my hand, is there anything that Bryn can feel or any sort of ties to the actual Belanusian um, tradition that Bryn can kind of gain? Yeah, as you are holding it in your hand and you're looking at it, the first, the type of metal, the brass is very, very common, especially in a lot of older a lot of older metalwork um, from Bellinui. And the compass rose is a, or at least this specific kind of compass rose. I'm, I'm not quite sure how different it is from like the standard one. I'm imagining that uh, the, like the core of this compass rose, rather than just being like a simple circle, is that of an eye. And you know that this symbol belonged to like would belong to an old pirate not a pirate lord or anything like that but an old belanusian pirate by the name of francois gideon that was yeah this was his symbol um is there anything spiritual about this item at all i think you can feel a faint hum from this you can feel it reverberate in your hand as something very familiar about this not necessarily the metal itself or the, the 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 or the locket itself almost something inside of it embedded in it in such a way it has the same kind of hum that the ship does bryn kind of uh you know holding this and like and like thumbing over it uh looks up and like and and looks in the eyes of this woman i think through the veil you can see a faint two green glowing orbs behind the veil in this hood and looks at this one, and this woman is like, "Wow, you have quite a beautiful collection." Thank you, thank you. I'm quite interested in this trinket. Um, to be honest with you, um, yes. how much for an item like this? Well, uh, normally it's, it's priceless, as you might imagine. Ah, uh, but uh, yes, ah, uh, um, but I can. For an esteemed collector such as yourself, uh, I could uh, let it go for 300 gold. Wow, quite a steep price. I'm willing to pay. I am good for it, I promise. But with a price like that, I guess maybe you have something to share a little less of the physical and more of the verbal. Ah, uh, I, I, I do not know what you mean. Being someone who sees artifacts like this come and go through these stalls every day, I heard of a great collector, and I think both of I, both of you admire such a collector in this city where we say, do you know any wonderful artifacts that this collector may have gotten their hands on? I like hearing these stories. I like hearing things that move to these cities, things that I could have gotten my hands on. Another collector? Uh, oh, Sergio. Yes, 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 yes. Ah, oh, Sergio... Great, great, great man, great man. Very rich, very rich. He also collects, yes. Really? Yes. What does he collect? Artifacts. Artifacts of the old, old, old days. 
back during the reign of monsters. Oh, that's quite exciting. Has anything recently come through that he's procured? You see she kind of recedes a little bit, almost as if she's afraid to to, to speak anything to you, a stranger. Oh, well, uh, you know, I've heard some, you know, hearsay, nothing specific. Uh, yes, of course. The, all these things are whispers and chitter-chatter on the stalls. Yes, yes, yes. But, but, but lock it, but lock it. Uh, maybe if you pay. Are you trying to parlay with her right now that you'll buy this locket if she tells you? Roll me a parlay. Roll plus polish. Six. Don't. Uh, Six. That is a, hey, you get plus one experience. So grab, grab your experience. I, 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 I shouldn't say. I shouldn't say. Just, uh, just, do you want locket or not? I can do a locket. Um, you said 300 gold. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, painstakingly, like, Bryn um, reaches in and, you know, divvies up everything. Um, they'll bring me down to um, 200, 200, 200, 200, 200 coin. Yes, coin. That's on me. I was saying gold. No, you're it's okay. Too close to gold. Yeah. Um, would this locket uh, also, this locket would also be counted as heavy, correct? That is correct. I'm trying to remember, what exactly do I incur from having a heavy item? Having a heavy item means character can only carry an amount of heavy items equal to their blood, minimum of zero. If they carry more than that, they must move very slowly and do nothing else. What is your blood? Negative one. <laughs> Rip. Uh, characters can only carry an amount of heavy items equal to their blood, minimum of zero. If they carry more than that, they must move very slowly and do nothing else. I, like you can move slowly, but like you can't like do you can't, you can't like, run. run. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like as like you know the transaction goes, and and Bryn takes a moment to more thoroughly like sense the locket. You see when you say it hums, I imagine this has a sort of connection to the same the same connection that the ship has to the skies. Yes, it hums with the reverberation of meteorite dust. Bryn holds it in one hand and like, like and kind of like gently um like unravels like one of um her wrists to reveal the like the markings as well. Mm -hmm. Um and like extends her hand to the market, like the woman in the market and is like, May I? Like reaching out a hand. She hesitantly gives it to you. No, no, like no, like like her hand. Oh sorry. Oh yeah, 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 like her hand. Yeah. She hesitantly gives her hand to you. Bryn takes a moment and closes her eyes and, like, thumbs over the locket and, like, the same with, like, over the top of her hand. Um, and Bryn tries to gather any sort of voices that call out from this space and through this, this, um, this relic about this woman and about her life and about her well-being. You get... Hmm. Roll plus Spitfire for me. Cool. That is a 10. Okay. On a 10. As she touches the top of this locket held out by your hand, you get this image of her at home sitting with her children. They're young, uh, probably somewhere in between like three to five. Uh, they're playing with some of the like trinkets that she has here, like as relics. They're playing with them like they're toys because that's what they are. Uh, you can see, like, she has this young daughter who's, like, playing with uh, this doll and the uh, her young son also, like, playing with another doll. They're, like, together playing house as if they are, like, uh, as if, like, the two dolls are, you know, a family of some kind. And uh, she is, like, sitting in the corner of this room, like, knitting, watching her kids uh, play with these toys. And you can see that there is this look on her face of desperation uh where like she is looking at these kids and she wants them to be happy she likes seeing that they are happy in this moment that they are playing with these toys but there is this inner kind of torment of how do i keep this moment how do i keep them in this state how do i make sure that they are still happy 
how do I make sure that I can still provide for them? The place that they're in isn't fancy. It's simple. It is small home, not un- unappointed. There is decorations here or there. You imagine uh, the most of the stuff around uh, their clothes even are, are hand-knitted by her. But they aren't well off. Far from it. Uh, after like this vision, uh, Bryn looks up at her and I know this feeling. It's a fear of seeing the ones you love be hurt the way you have. The more you run from it, the more you fear it, the more you will hurt them yourself. Give them your love and let them grow. If you really do believe in the tales of Belenusha, take a moment to read and explore the world. The, the world has much more to offer than you could ever know. Your family will be happy. You will be happy. Just find peace with those moments. May the Celestials guide you, and may Stardust always be underfoot. And Bren recedes and wraps at her hand and begins to walk away. So, if I may, before you walk away, there is fear in her eyes. She has felt this connection that she has made with you. There is this moment that there is this horror, this... She cannot tell if you have taken something from her. She has felt this weird, this strange connection with you. And before you can properly gather your stuff and walk away, she sprints away, yelling, bringing a great amount of tension in your direction. We're going to cut from there to Thorin. Right. Well, Thorin walks away from the group, and before making it just a few steps... Starts to hear singing. (laughs) (laughs) There has been a time or two in the past where this would have perhaps caused some concern with the ruckus, but Thorin has worked with Felix enough to know that this is just a part of things. I don't think, I don't think Thorin should necessarily not be concerned about this, but yeah, no, that's, that's Mm -hmm. fair. Center most, uh, very ambient on it. Very, well, there it is. That's my cue to get to the corner. And that is what he does. We see Thorin go over to kind of a shady corner. And he is gazing the surrounding areas. He takes Eldorus, perches her on his finger. And he says, Eldor, to the sky. Dragon marked as a means to tell her to search from the skies to see if she can see anyone that has anything resembling a dragon mark or of the like. And while she is doing that, he is also kind of taking the perimeter to kind of shuffle about quietly as Felix has. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah, you, like, kind of walk away from where, (laughs) uh, Felix is, like, doing his singing, and, like, the crowd is, like, starting to grow at that point, and you are taking the perimeter, looking around, uh, you've sent Eldorus off, uh, to the sky to, uh, look around as well, um, and I think, like, as you're, like, probably standing by one of the railings overlooking the lower markets and the docks, uh, this is when you notice, uh, you see Avery walking down uh, with like a plate of <laughs> plate a, a plate of paella, uh, kind of like munching off of it as he is looking, uh, like kind of window shopping through uh, through the streets, and you see him get bumped by one of this uh, group of people that you probably noticed have walked off of uh, this ship very gaudily uh, and uh, ostentatiously dressed, carrying these crates and, like, bumping into them. As you notice that, you see that there are a couple of, like, groups of these people, like, carrying, like, these these marked crates, um, but not to the same place. You see that they're kind of spreading out, even, going to uh, several, like, different, like, parts of, of, the, of the markets here. Ah, shice. Upon seeing this... Thorin has to take it in for a second of, of which shit show 
to kind of follow up with. Uh, you you look over towards the direction you saw the captain walk in, uh, walking, and you see her enter a bathhouse. Ah, Shizen. So be it. Thorin has decided to... Avery is an adult. He has made his decisions. Frankly, not my problem. And then Thorin is familiar with the Painted Fleet. Thorin has engaged with them in the past and knows them to be up to shenanigans they ought not be. So, seeing this and seeing the captain kind of seem out of reach, Thorin whistles for Eldorus to return. Mm -hmm. And does she? Oh yeah, she does. And upon that, you know, kind of perches her back, makes eye contact with her, has her eyes follow one of the groups that are petering off. So Eldorus is going to, from the sky, covertly follow one of these groups. I am going to follow the other. We will then meet back at the designated time. She's very smart. She understands these things. So you're just following one of the groups of crate carriers? Yeah, and Eldorus is following the other. And if she sees anything, shiny trinket... To re-clarify, there, the, there aren't just two. There are like six of these groups of people. But you can 100%, you can have Eldorus follow one and you follow the other. It is not all of them, though. I'm just clarifying this. Okay, yeah, I didn't know that. If there's that many... Yeah, it's like six groups of people carrying crates to different portions of... Yeah. Tragic. Okay, if there's that many, I think Thorin is going to leave... I think at this point, Thorne's going to grab the captain. How quickly can he run to get her? Yeah, I mean, you can. You see the bathhouse. You can run over to, to the captain as she's entering. I think she would know his whistle. Uh-huh. So Thorne kind of gives a very low whistle in the hopes that, you know, she'll kind of turn her head as she's walking into the bathhouse. You see, uh, you know, she's like about to step in when you whistle and like Eldorus comes swooping down to you and she turns to look in your direction. Oh no, come here. But I was going to go in the... Was gonna... Now. You said 10 minutes and you see she comes like stomping over to you past where Felix is like, has started like getting to the point where like the guards have come over and like crossed arms are watching him. And we pay them no mind. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm creating a timeline here. <laughs> no, I know, it's great. Uh, I love it. Come with me to the railing. What you can't see anymore, but what I did just see was a young Avery Alistair stomping about. What? I told that. And chomping on food. That is the least of our worries. That is merely a palate cleanser for the ship. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> I am explaining things. Okay, fine. Please, continue. What? The Painted Fleet is here. What? Why? What? Those fuckers? Where did you get your information from? How did you know about Sergio? I, it was, I, I know a guy. I know a lot of guys, but this specific guy, he works for, uh, the, the Nurse Shark. I don't remember his name. You know. No, works for one of the. He works for one of the sharks. Why? Why is that important? How many people could have gotten this information? They're bringing on crates. Look at them. There's several different groups. I don't know. Maybe they have stuff to sell. You think they're the buyers? I don't know. Or do you think they're trying to steal it as well? Either way, it's a problem. Go team. You wouldn't know anything about that. Crates? No. <sighs> well, maybe it's not. And as she starts saying that, that's when you hear a scream from down, from down below as you see this short running woman like running through um running through uh the street the streets away from something uh which you see like has some guards like kind of beginning to gather around like that area and then you also simultaneously hear the the shocked surprise of the people not terribly far away from you as a smoke centipede rises from the open mouth of Felix Cormier uh... <laughs> these kids i'm going to send you all home 
<laughs> Bryn, what are you doing in uh, in response to the woman running away from you and guards starting to like turn their eyes in your direction and starting to walk towards you? The guards taking notice. You see one of them is starting to walk towards you and says, Hey, what's going on over here then? Um, I'm not quite sure. She was a disturbed woman. Um, she kept mumbling on about spirits and some sort of demon. She seemed quite disturbed. This seems like a lie. A hoodwink even. Roll plus polish. I'm also you're gonna uh you're gonna take a weakness for this. Uh take take socially challenged until uh until you have uh fixed this weakness you have minus one on going to polish uh the way that you fix this weakness is by having a social success and so you see the guards kind of look back and forth uh at each other and then go all right come with us it's it's just for question you know we'll we'll get you we'll get her we'll you know we'll settle this thing squared away uh, Thorin, you and the captain are watching these two guards uh, attempting to apprehend Bryn. <sighs> I think Avery, you can also see this happening. Can Thorin still see Avery? Yeah. Yeah, you can see Avery uh, from up here as well. Avery just has like half a bite of like paella in his mouth and is holding two kebabs that he's going to bring back to <laughs> Pontaneva. And just kind of staring. You hear a whistle. Do you look up at it? Yeah, where it came from? Absolutely. I'm watching this happen. Totally. And yeah. You see Thorin looking at you and does the number where he's staring dead in your eyes, points and snaps, pointing back down to the ground. Here. Now. I, I like, I, and I like motion at my neck and I'm, and I like gesture back at the ship like, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm on the ship. Thorin is walking towards you while still pointing now here. You see the captain look over uh, Thorin's shoulder and points at you and like does literally the same thing. <laughs> is Fontaneva like still looking up? Because I, I imagine that I'm still within like... She's on the ship. Well, I imagine that I haven't she's, wandered. She's on the ship. She's not okay. looking. At Never mind then. Yeah, she's not looking at you. She's on the ship. You're, yeah. I, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I, like, kind of hang my head and just, like, walk over. Yeah, you do that. Uh, Bryn, uh, these two guards are, uh, one of them, uh, like, just tries to go for your shoulder to, to bring you along with them. Felix, uh, the smoke centipede is uh, writhing in the air, like kind of crawling on translucent ground, uh, like up and around where everything is. You see people are like watching it in awe. You have also heard this scream from down there and you can see uh, Thor and Eldorus and uh, Captain Hano, like uh, not terribly far off, like a good like 30, 40 feet away from you, looking over the railing down at wherever that sound came from. Uh, and you can see that these guards uh, up here are like starting to recover and are like, they look pissed off. Okay. I think Felix, you know, saw a potential person of interest in the crowd, but also heard this scream and perhaps is more interested in that. The lizard eyed person is walking away up the stairs as this is happening. Yeah, I think Felix is more interested in the scream. Felix, uh, calls like the the centipede like back to him and uh as it as it approaches him he says uh he he says to the crowd this has been uh lunulata uh my time unfortunately is up but hopefully i will see you all again very soon and he uh snaps his fingers and the uh smoke centipede like explodes into like a, a like a larger cloud of smoke and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. amidst the uh explosion he uh ducks into the crowd awesome it certainly does sound like you're trying to break in or out so this is an interesting uh one isn't it oh 100 percent, 100 percent uh because uh your smoke spirit damien does have control over this. And so, you know, 
when you roll this, it'll decide what happens. Okay. Uh, roll plus blood. Roll plus blood. Okay. Oof. Oh, that's a snake eyes. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's a, so that's a, that's a two. That's a two. I got a two. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Well, you get a uh, plus one experience, so that's good. That's a great that's start great. off here. That's great. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. I'm going to give you the weakness bedeviled. You uh, will now be compelled when your demon feels or desires something, you feel or desire the same. And the way to get rid of this weakness is a hard-won moment of humanity. When the smoke cloud explodes out, there is this cry of the people as like the, 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 the smoke stings their eyes and they uh, kind of are repelled backwards, including uh, the, the two blue coats. And you begin to move through the smoke. And as you try to, your arms and legs feel less controlled by you. You feel yourself going numb as you try to escape from the people around you. And smoke begins to sting your eyes so much to the point where you close them. And as you're just like kind of running blindly in the direction of what you believe to be safety, you come out on the other end of the smoke and you find yourself in a room. You aren't in the square anymore. You find yourself in a small room, the smoke dissipating around you. It's dark in here. The only light coming from the wooden blinds of the singular door leading out of this room. You see that there are boxes and crates, barrels and kind of things like kind of just kind of thrown in here. You, you, you believe it's a storage closet of some kind. Okay. I, I, so so I, I think Felix says like aloud talking, talking to Damien. He, he says, where am I? Where you should be. My friend, you must realize that's not an answer. Take a look. 